It's a pleasure to speak with you. I, I've been in many rooms where you've performed, but I've never had a conversation with you after all these years on Long Island. I'm dialing in from Long Beach. Have you ever played a gig in this town? Um, I don't know if I ever played Long Beach, but it's funny. I was just talking about a gig we did in Island Park, which is right down the block. I uh, played the Island Park quite a quite a bit, um, probably before your time, I'm guessing. But yeah. The Wonderama days? Oh, even before then. Uh, I used to play a place called Industry Steel uh, yes, in yes. Island Park. And uh, I, there's a couple other places. I don't even remember the names anymore, but I remember Industry Steel. That was a lot of fun. Industry comes up in conversation. People say that they saw Biohazard and all yeah. these metal bands there. Did John Hampson have a metal era? I, I wouldn't call it metal, but I definitely was in a like a big, so we'll call it big rock with you know, like big guitars and uh, early 90s, uh, right before I started Nine Days. Uh, that I was I was in a band. I played I played guitar in the band. I, I didn't I wasn't the singer. And we played a, all the clubs on Long Island, like Sundance and Bayshore and Industry oh, yeah. Steel and um, got like Spit in Levittown, like all these like rock, rock cool clubs that just died like around 1993, four, somewhere in there. They just all died. It's funny when you dig into that element of Long Island. Sundance, Guns N' Roses literally played there. Yes. Yeah. The biggest bands ever played at all these clubs on Long yeah. Island. And I, I remember, I don't mean to cut you off, I just got to take a quick, I remember a friend of mine trying to get me to go see a band called Allison Chains at Sundance. And I thought that it was Allison, like the girl's name, Allison Chains. And I, that sounds like the dumbest band. I'm not going. Big regret. <laughs> and, and then a couple of miles from industry, if even that, that club, the Action House, where Pink Floyd and Zappa and the Grateful Dead all oh God, played yeah. the here, The Doors, etc. I didn't even know that. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I missed that one. But the bottom line is, we're talking here, and you have decades of playing the highest tier levels and the lowest tier levels on Long yeah. Island. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You played the garden thanks to the jingle ball uh -huh. so many headline gigs and there's been a cool renaissance with your music in the past couple of years mojo music and media i think has a little bit to do with that or did they come on board after the sync started happening well i mean uh i'm trying to think uh mix really mojo uh, i signed with mojo uh publishing about just over a year ago and um they're just fantastic i mean they're 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 a place that I, I've been looking for for 20 something years, you know, like more a boutique agency, but that's, you know, playing in the big leagues. And uh, it just so happened that, you know, I was introduced to uh, to Mark uh, Freed, who who runs it. And, um, you know, like so I, I didn't think about it at the time, but like whenever I'm talking to somebody at that at Mojo, I'm literally talking to the top guy. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of. It's kind of cool. It's good. Yeah. So rewinding, you know, everything, everywhere, all at once that happened. The Jordy usage where she adapted your song happened. There is the Apple TV show that used it about two weeks ago. You're good at keeping yep. secrets. A lot of artists would be teasing or there would, they'd be saying right. big things happening, big things happening, but you were able to keep a secret on all these. Yeah, I'm, I can keep secrets and I don't mean that in some sort of like sketchy way. I just, I honor, I honor it. You know, when, when somebody needs me to keep quiet, I will honor that. And I also, I'm not a big fan of the announcement that we're going to make an announcement. Like I always kind of find that like redundant. Uh, but also with all these projects, like with the film, uh, you know, that's not my film. I'm honored that I got to be part of it. I don't want to like be the one who's talking at a turn or spoiling something and, uh, and, and the same thing with Jordy, um, and, and the Jordy thing came up in the summer and, and Mojo was a big part of that and helping me make that happen. Um, and that was Jordy's thing, you know, that's, that's his song. And I, I'm like honored to, to have this connection and, and to have played a part in inspiring it, but that's his thing. And I, I same kind of thing. I, I wasn't about to go out and start, you know, spoiling it. I actually, I, I was in his video, did a little cameo. And I did post one picture from the set, but I didn't say anything about, I just said, hey, I'm gonna be in a, in a video. Cause I was too cool to not put out there, but I, you know, I definitely didn't wanna reveal anything that, that wasn't my place to reveal. 
Well, it's a cool resurgence, as I said, because for Long Islanders, nine days never went away, but the full-time touring aspect of your life went away once you became a teacher at a high level and everyone, the legend of Mr. Hampson is why in a, in a very good way, but is it now more of like a summer and holiday thing, the way that you view your musical career? So without getting too deeply philosophical about it, here's, here's the honest truth. Like I could not get away from, from music and, and writing if I wanted to. And I have many times thought to myself, my life would be so much easier and less complicated if I didn't have this <laughs> deep rooted, you know, need to be creative. It, it just consumes me at times. And, but I've, I've been writing songs. Now I didn't say good songs, but I've been writing songs since I was literally in elementary school, you know, right. um, I, I my I remember the first thing I ever wrote. I was in third grade on the bus looking out the window and it was about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I didn't know at the time that they were the same person. I just knew the gist of it. Um, but anyway, the, the point is, for me, it's just my life. It is who I am. I am a creative musician, creative writer. Um, I'm always writing something, whether it's lyrics, poetry, uh, or melodies and music. It's just, it never stops. It's never left. I have been creative, you know, every, I don't want to say every second, because that's not true. And, but uh, forever, I, I just, it's just who I am. So I don't think of it in terms of summer or weekends now in terms of if I'm going to go play shows. Yeah, uh, that's a different story. That's managing it. You know, like if I'm going to go out and do shows, it's going to be on the weekends and, or in the summer. Um, but I don't think of it that way in, in terms of the music, you know, it's, it's not, it's not something that I sort of dust off every once in a while and, and do it's pretty much part of my everyday life. Yeah. The timeline of nine days is also incredible in that it overlapped with so many other Long Island bands that got signed around the same time in a variety of genres. So stage was happening. That was another band. Mm -hmm. Diffuser was around the same time. All the yeah. emo pop punk bands like Brand New, Taking Back Sunday, From Autumn to Ashes, Glastra, yet you are also disconnected from each other. And I said that because a lot of scenes, let's say there was five bands from El Paso that got signed at the same time. People would all go, the El Paso music scene. Yet yeah. as far as I knew, you were isolated from the majority of those groups. It was never the Long Island scene starring Nine Days. No. Um, yeah, it, it's weird. And I don't really have an answer for it because I'm actually doing a show in May with Wheatus and they're from Long Island. Yes. I don't think we've ever met. And, you know, we, we came out at basically the same time. I, they had a teenage dirtbag, a hit in 2000, story of a girl came out in 2000. I don't know. I have no idea how we didn't cross paths. Diffuser, I didn't meet uh, until after, well after everything. Uh, the guys in stage, I remember them, but I, I I remember them more because there was a contest for opening for Bon Jovi at Jones Beach in like 1998 or seven or something, and they beat us out in that, and so we hated them. <laughs> we didn't know them, but it was like those son of a, you know. Um, yeah. But there were a bunch of bands. There there was um, uh, Fuzz Bubble was a great band, and they got signed yes. to Puff Daddy's label. Uh, I was friendly with some of those guys. I knew, knew a couple of them really well. Um, there were a lot of bands, but yeah, there, Long Island did not really have, it did, did not have a cohesive scene. I mean, you know Long Island. I mean, the, you go 15, 20 minutes west or east, right? Every 15 minutes, you're, you may as well be in a different state. It's a weird place. Uh, so there isn't a lot of cohesion on Long Island. Uh, there's the Nassau Suffolk, you know, thing. And then forget about it. If you're in Brooklyn or Queens, you're not even considered Long Island. It's not, you know, it's, it's not. And the emo bands, if that's, if that's what we're calling them, uh, came out a few years after us, a couple of years, really. And I don't know any of those guys. Uh, and we've never crossed paths in any way, shape or form. So it is, it's a little weird. It would be cooler if everybody was was friendly and we created some scene but it, it never happened trying to con connect all the dots here was any of the 90s merchandise ever done by merch direct oh god i don't honestly don't even know um 
I don't remember, you know, there, there were certain things I was really hands on with, but not, not the merch. I, I don't know. It's possible. Oh, I just don't that, know. That would have been your connection to Glassjaw because that okay. company was founded by the guitarist, the Glassjaw. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Who knows? All the emo bands, I think their third and fourth clients were taking back Sunday and brand new. And then the ascent of wow. everything happened. Yeah, but good I would, I would venture to say, this is the first time in history, the past couple of years, where Long Island has actually been a cool, recognized musical destination, seeing the number of venues that have opened up and stayed mm -hmm. open, that yeah. there's a good gig every night of the week, yet that wasn't the case in the early days of Nine Days or Wanderama. No, not at all. I mean, well, you know, what it was, without getting too long-winded about it, I remember when I was a teenager, like 15, 16, all the way up until I was probably in my early 20s, there were places for original bands. There were places that when you went there on a Friday or a Saturday night, you knew you were going to see original bands and they would be packed. And it was it was I loved it. I, I was I was a kid, you know. But then I do remember sometime in that early 90s, uh, they just kind of lost it. And um you know, the cover band world was blowing up and I got involved in it sort of reluctantly. I had no interest in it. I always wanted, I was always writing my own music. I really had yeah. no interest in cover, but you know, so I, I'm working a job. I was working at music land actually in Lindenhurst. And I think I made like $250 a week there. Uh, plus like commissions, which could be a few dollars. But I remember my rent was like 375 bucks. So it was fine. I could manage, you know, I didn't need much. It was just, that was, I was enough. And then a friend of mine was like, Hey, we really need somebody to fill in. We're doing this cover gig. It's a Tuesday night. I'm like, fine. I'll learn a bunch of covers. And they paid me like 150 bucks on a Tuesday night. And then I'm thinking, and wow, that's that's more than half of what I'm making in a week. And then they were like, hey, we, we got another gig tomorrow night. Do you want to do it? They paid me another 150 bucks. <laughs> so I just you start thinking I can basically play a few nights a week and have the rest of my life free to devote to writing music, recording music, rehearsing all day instead of getting out of work. Everybody's getting out of work at, you know, six, whatever. And you go to a rehearsal studio for a few hours at night. So I slowly convinced everybody, guys, let's just let's just do this. We will have all of our time to be creative. Now, on the downside of that was we we weren't touring. You know, we were playing tri-state area and, and making money so that we didn't have to go to a day job. And we would spend our days in studios and writing and demoing. And uh, and that worked for us. We were we were a tight band. We were playing literally four or five nights a week. So it worked. The Dublin pub was one of the venues I remember. Oh yeah. Circuit. Yeah. Every Thursday night, ladies night at the Dublin pub, we played there. Listen, I loved, I, I, I loved a lot of those people. I gotta be honest. I, I, I hated it at the same time, you know, like at least I'm playing my guitar and at least I'm singing and I'm doing music but it was, it was not, it was a little soul crushing. And we did it for about a year and a half to two years. And we, we did really well. Um, and when it ended, I took a job making about a quarter of what I was making, but I didn't care. I couldn't do it anymore. You know, it, it was, it was great, but it did, it did beat you up a little uh, on the creative side of things. You just felt a little, you felt a little like you were prostituting yourself. <laughs> so it was tough. Brothers spent a year or so in one of those Omnipop trivia bands. So I've heard a thing or two, but yeah. thank you, Omnipop is now crushing it with comedy and great yeah. comedians. So they've redeemed themselves on that end. But back to, yeah. you, back to you here. Are you allowed to say what's coming up in the next couple of months? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Are you allowed to say what's coming up in the next oh. couple of months for you as a musician, a performer, or creative, anything like that? Or are you keeping yeah. secrets? No, I'm not kidding. I won't. These these are not secrets. Um, so I am put, putting all of my energy, my creative energy, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. musically in, into um, uh, a, really. I have I've written about I don't even know a couple of albums worth of songs over the past three years, and with nine days has had various you know reasons why we just couldn't really put that together to make an album and i finally my my two sons graduated high school last year they're both in college now 
So I just feel like I have a little bit of a, of a window of time now that I haven't had for years that uh, I'm super excited to be creative. Um, I, I put together a great band. Uh, we are going to be playing some shows and really just putting together uh, an album. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know when I'm, I'm not rushing that when it's right. It's right. I'll go in the studio. And this is all this is, you know, vanity project. It's for me. Uh, I'm excited about it. And I am planning on playing a whole bunch of shows over the summer uh, and uh, probably starting in May with this festival that we're doing out on the island at uh, Bald Hill with uh, oh. Wallflower and Blues Traveler and Weedis, finally. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just I'm excited to kind of put some real time into the musical part of my life again. And that's the plan. Hmm. So it's interesting to see things come full circle where some of the people are the original fans. Some of the people are younger people because they found the film and TV projects. Other right. people are saying the 90s thing, even though you're not a 90s band. No. <laughs> Yet then you yeah. could do the 2000s circuit. Yeah. You mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people at this point in time. Yeah, you know, and it's funny, the Nine Days is a 90s band, but we had our hit in 2000, which in some ways is the worst year for us to have had a hit. Yeah. Um, but but we were a band that started in 1995. We put out three indie albums on our own. We played a million shows, uh, even outside of the cover thing. I mean, Nine Days played a lot of shows as an original band. Uh, so, you know, it's always been a weird thing for us, too, because we sort of straddled this line uh, of of time and eras, and we, we kind of got caught in the middle. But yeah, there, there's there's nostalgia that comes back around. The song has sort of found itself back in the zeitgeist of the moment for different yeah. reasons. Uh, and that is, I got to tell you, you know, it's just something that I never, you don't plan on that kind of stuff anyway, but I don't think I ever even really uh, hoped for it or or dreamed of it. You know, it, it, it's something that I, I constantly feel like, I can't believe this song still has this life. It still has this interest and you know with Jordy doing his version and and the film uh the Daniels uh from everything everywhere all at once when that conversation happened they used a couple of lines from story of a girl as dialogue in the film so these are incredible things that are happening 23 years after the song was a hit so uh, you know I'm I'm very fortunate the last question I have for you, speaking of the song, and keep in mind, I loved the second single more than I did that song. I'll, Thank I'll you. play the elitist card <laughs> on that end. But Thank you. with Story of a Girl, when did it go from, this is our hit, we've played it too many times? Because when you're making a music video, you have to lip sync it a hundred times and you never want to hear it again. And then you have yeah. to play it every radio. I get that. But when did it yeah. go from that to the people are excited I love it. And it does not feel like a monotonous task to play this based on how the people are reacting. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, there have been shows where I have felt like weird that I have to play the song, but there are shows that, that are, I'm at home and I know half the audience <laughs> and they're like people that maybe are the mind. And I know they're all like, kind of like, Oh geez, you got to play it. But I don't really think I ever felt that way about the song. And it's because I always, I knew from pretty much the moment that I wrote it, that there was something different, that there was something special about it. And it was our ticket. You know, we, we were banging on the door and trying to get to bigger and better things for a long time. And, and when that song happened, I just knew, I was very well aware. I wasn't a kid. I wasn't 20 years old. I was 20 when I wrote it and I was 28 when it finally got released so that's young but it's it's not that young when you've spent at that point literally since I was 18 I mean I graduated high school and that was I was all music so 10 years to get to that point yeah. so I never took it for granted it, it, and um you know I just I'm, I'm grateful for it you know I don't I don't begrudge playing it you never know with that because you know, one of my favorite bands, Not A Surf, they didn't play popular for a lot of years. That was the resentful right. major yeah. thing. I think Super Drag was not playing Sucked Out for a couple of years. So yeah. sometimes there is that natural hate towards the hit, but glad to yeah. hear that you're popular. I'm sorry, that you're favorable about the whole thing, even all these years later. 
Well, I, I will say there was one show where I didn't play it because I was kind of like, ah, I'm not going to play this. And it felt so weird. I was like, why did I do that? Why, why did I not play that song that everybody wants to hear and, and is happy to hear? What, what did I just accomplish? You know, like some artistic statement. But I do understand why other bands would not. You know, I do get it. But for me, uh, I tried it once and I was like, that was just sort of indulgent. And I should, I just felt, it felt incomplete to me. So I'll play it. Well happily. said. Oh, well, I'm looking forward to that gig that you talked about with the Wallflowers. I'm looking forward to that new band with the new music and all that. But yeah. in the meantime, thank you for the many years of great music, John. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. And, and I love that you, you talked about If I Am, the second single, because that's the one that I thought. I was like, this is the one. This is when people are going to realize, wow, these guys are a great band. They're not just a one-hit wonder, but life had other plans. The, the strings, the build-up to the chorus, <laughs> hey... You never know. It might have that sync placement thanks to the team at Mojo in the near future. So fingers Yeah, crossed. let's let's get Mojo <laughs> on it. <laughs> thanks, Darren. I appreciate thanks. that. Have a great rest of the day. Take care. You too, man. Take care. Bye-bye.